Okay, welcome everybody to my presentation. As Ramon already said, I'll be talking about VTOL control and airspeed fault detection. So I'm Roman, um, I work for Ethereum as a flight control engineer, and I'm a somewhat regular contributor to Upstream PX4. Okay, I will uh, do a quick introduction, what VTOL is, why we are interested in it, what we can do with it, and also then I'll go ahead and have a look at the current VTOL control architecture implemented in PX4. Then I'll also go and have a look at a few uh, steps that we can do in the future to improve things. And then the second part of the presentation um, is going to be a slightly different topic, but somehow related. It's about airspeed fault detection. Okay, this is... All right, somehow this got messed up. Um, <laughs> this is the introduction. So what does VTOL actually mean? So VTOL is actually a German word and means VTOL, which means how nice. <laughs> well, not really. It actually stands for vertical takeoff and landing, as you better know. And what it really is in the easiest case is just a plane with a quadcopter uh, patched to it so that you have something that looks like this over there. So really it is um, a plane that can hover. Why do we do these kind of things? So if we have a look at quadcopters, what we like about them is their ability to hover. We like them to carry our cameras, do pictures, and also a very big advantage is that they can pretty much land anywhere. You don't need, need long runways like for traditional fixed wings. But also, on the other hand, people want to fly more efficiently. They want to do long missions. They want to map uh, big areas, so they want long flight time. They also want to be fast. They want to have uh, more payload. So definitely, we would want to have the advantages of pure fixed wings. And if you combine those two, you, of course, end up with a VTOL. So it makes sense to do these things. Also, I'm pretty sure most of you are aware of these projects. Um, Big companies are doing it. I think you have a feeling that everybody nowadays sort of does VTOL. So if they do it, it's probably a good thing. Okay, I have to go back now. <laughs> um, I quickly want to have a look at a few different VTOL types that we support in PX4. My goal with this slide is actually not to convince you that any of these types are the best or you should use this one or that one. Um, if you look at the industry, you see that there are different companies using different types, and it really depends on the mission, so there's not the best thing. It'll, it'll, it will always be a compromise. Let's start with tail sitters on the very left. That's probably the most popular example that we have, uh, Wingtra. Um, the tail sitter achieves the transition by not tilting any motors or having any propulsion system that only works in fixed wing, but it actually just uh, tilts the whole body and um, completes a transition like this. This makes it a bit more difficult to control um, in terms of flight control. Uh, you have to go through a 90 degrees pitch transition. Probably a Euler angle controller will not work anymore unless you handle the corner cases. Um, especially this type is quite challenging to fly in wind, as probably wing truck can, can tell you. Um, but on the other hand, it has its advantages, right? I mean, it has pretty, like, it has less actuators. Um, it's very, very simple, very complex. Uh, so the simplicity is really a strong point of this type. We also support tilt rotors. You can see an example there in the middle. Those are generally easier to control, I would say. Um, they're mechanically a bit more complex because they tilt the motors to achieve the transition to forward flight. Um, that can also be a bit challenging, as we'll see later. We actually do change the mixture geometry, um, and we, we, we can get uh, uh, coupling effects when we do the transition, so there is some kind of handling we need to do there, and I'll tell you a bit more about this later. Um, then the third type, quad plane, or aka standard VTOL, that's basically the, just a brute force approach. You have a plane, and you add multi-copter motors to it, and you have a basically two different systems. From my point of view, it's definitely the most easy thing to control, and I think many companies also use it because of this. Um, it has many actuators that can be a pro and a con. I mean, it's, it's more weight. It also gives you redundancy. 
um, and it kind of it's tempting to put a fuel engine in there and still have your separate quad motors. Okay, let's have a look at the VTOL control architecture high level that is in PX4. Probably you've seen from the other presentation that PX4 is very modular and we try to put function, functional stuff into modules. For VTOL, the special thing is that you have multi-copter and fixed wing modules running at the same time. So if you go to the top left, you see that we have a multi-copter position controller and a fixed wing position controller running. Um, the special thing about VTOL is that they don't publish to the standard attitude set point topics that you usually see, but they publish to virtual topics. That means it's actually not the final topic, but this is consumed by a module that's called the VTOL attitude controller. The VTOL, VTOL attitude controller is actually not really an attitude controller, it's more like VTOL logic that basically decides in which situation to use which set point or maybe generate an entirely different set point. So what you can see at the bottom, there is a attitude vector or set point coming out of there, which is then consumed by, again, a multi-copter attitude controller and a fixed wing attitude controller. Both of those, they run in parallel and they output a rate set point, uh, the desired rates based on the attitude error. Now we have a switch there that basically decides in every situation which rate set point to use. In hover, you would definitely use the one for the attitude controller, uh, the multi-copter one, and vice versa in fixed wing. And in transition, you could do something in between. Um, but the, the important thing is that this rate set point goes to both multi-copter and fixed wing rate controllers, which are two separate modules running. And there is a clear, distinct mapping for actuators to these rate controllers. So the multi-copter rate controller controls the motors in hover, and the fixed wing rate controllers controls the control surfaces. And you can run these actually in parallel. Lastly, you can see the, the virtual controls, the output of the controllers. You reroute them again through the VTOL module as virtual control topics, which is mostly done due to corner case handling. OK. The advantages of this structure is that um, we have one ray controller that always controls the same set of actuators. We can take advantage of that um, by, for example, using the multi-copter ray controller in fixed wing mode, should you, for example, have a uh, control surfaces failure or you detect a stall or whatever, you can use the ray controller for that. Also, you can use fixed wing control surfaces to aid controlling in strong winds when you're hovering. The challenging part about this is that we basically create a meso system, so we have um, multiple inputs for a single output. Take, for example, the, the roll axis. You now have motors using differential thrust and control surfaces that try to do the same thing, and it's not straightforward anymore to just tune them. Okay, I want to have a look a bit of future work that I think would be worthwhile in the future to, to have a look at. Um, I think it would be good moving towards control allocation. What does that mean? I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with our mixing system that we use in PX4. So the controllers, I'm just using a name for this, but it's rate controller that I mean. They output a, a dimensionless torque and thrust demand uh, for each axis. These signals um, are consumed by the mixer and what the mixer does is basically translates this to specific um, actuator signals. So depending on if you have a quad, an octocopter, um, it basically decides what motor does what for the specific movements the controller wants to do. And the problem that we have right now that this mapping is actually fixed. So if we have fun things like this, which actually tilt their motors during a transition, this mapping is actually not correct anymore. So the vehicle thinks it's still a quadcopter, but actually you've tilted the motors and you start to see coupling effects. So the vehicle tries to correct for yaw, uh, roll, sorry, and at the same time this couples into yaw and it starts to do weird stuff. Um, currently the way we do is, is we actually have logic inside the controllers that kind of try to take care of this, but could be better. 
That's why it would be good to, at some point, move that logic out of the controllers and push it back into uh, the mixer. That would be rather than a control allocator. It would enhance our mixers to do with this kind of control allocation. Um, it would help us um, to keep the advantage that, we, that our controllers remain independent of the specific uh, vehicle configuration, uh, which then in turn also allows more precise control during transitions. As I said, it could eliminate the coupling, and it would also enable in the future fault-tolerant control. Um, by that, I mean vehicles that are over-actuated and that can actually take advantage of reallocating the, the allocation um, in case uh, some, some actuator fails. Good. Lastly, I want to say a bit something about documentation. Um, we basically have two parts here. There's some tuning information for VTOL on the, def uh, on the, on the PX4 user guide. Um, you can search for VTOL in the user guide and you'll get there. Um, the most important features for VTOL are documented there, such as weather vane. Um, we also have airframe references for VTOL that we've built. Um, they might not be always up to date, but it's a good starting point. And uh, we, yeah, we generally need more docs, so I guess that's always true. Okay, I want to move to the second part now, which is the airspeed uh, fault detection and handling. So I'm going to start by explaining why we actually use airspeed sensors for fixed wing planes. So definitely, one thing we want to do is we want to maximize our flight efficiency. And planes tend to fly at an airspeed or tend to be most efficient at a specific airspeed. So we want to know what that airspeed is, and we want to control the plane to that airspeed. But it's also a safety aspect. So airplanes can stall, as you know. And uh, if you fly them too fast and do maneuvers, you can get structural damage. So it's, it's a safety aspect. You want to know at what airspeed you're going. Um, it's also relevant for flight performance. For example, we use airspeed to, to do gain scheduling, or in other words, to scale our... Uh, signals of the controllers um, because we have a high dependency on airspeed. The faster you go, the less deflection you need to get to a certain torque. Lastly, also for robustness, <coughs> we can actually make use of airspeed. So um, we can limit attitude drift by fusing airspeed measurements into the EKF uh, if we lose GPS. Okay, now we know what we want to use it for, but what are the problems with that? So Unlike the IMU, which is kind of like inside the flight controller, well protected, the airspeed sensor or the pitot tube um, is sticking outside and is therefore directly exposed to, uh, to the airflow and uh, vulnerable to blockage. So if this happens, it's, it's very critical because um, our control uh, systems rely on airspeed and false airspeed data can actually lead to uh, things like flight into terrain, uh, the controller trying to pitch down the nose to regain the airspeed, but that doesn't happen, and uh, we, we might stall or overspeed. So we definitely want to be able to somehow detect these failures and, and then do something appropriately. Good. What do we have currently in PX4 that does um, <coughs> fault detection and, and handling? So... Um, Paul Riceboro did a first step at implementing some basic um, checks. Uh, it was PR10733 that just went in a couple of months ago. That's part of the release. Um, basically, uh, first of all, basic checks were implemented. So um, if there's data timeouts or stuff like that, um, we also check EKF airspeed innovations for consistency. Um, I will explain later a bit more what these are, and there is also a load factor consistency check right now in PX4 that can be used to detect false airspeed data. I want to quickly uh, say something about that. That might be interesting. So um, the load factor of an airplane is basically, you can imagine it as how many Gs you pull or how heavy you feel in the seat of your airplane. And there is a direct 
relation between the load factor and the stall airspeed of the plane. So if you're in a turn at um, level altitude and you're in a 60 degrees bank, you're going to have a, a 2G load factor. That means you, you'll have an increased stall speed. So if your airspeed sensor at that point tells you that you're below a certain value and you calculate the theoretical value with your load factor, then you kind of know that something is probably wrong. So this check is useful for detecting low airspeed readings. So this is what we have currently now in PX4. Now I'm going to, before I'm going to show you what we want to do next, I'm quickly going to tell you something about wind estimators. So in PX4 we have a wind estimation library, which is um, a library that enables you to estimate wind in north and east direction and an airspeed scale factor by providing true airspeed measurements and a zero side slip assumption. I'm going to explain both of them really quick. If you can see this triangle here on the very left, you see the green vector is your ground speed vector. It's basically the direction the plane is, is, is moving. Then you have the blue vector at the top, which is the wind vector relative to the Earth. And the yellow vector is then basically the, the air data vector or the combination. It's what the airplane really sees. We can measure the yellow vector with an airspeed sensor, and we know our ground speed, and so we can basically reconstruct the wind from that. The second measurement we can use is the so-called zero side slip assumption, which can be illustrated using the second picture. So you can see this plane there. It's, it's, it's flying along this horizontal line, the thick horizontal line, but you can see that it's actually looking somewhere else, like its heading is different than the direction, and that's because it has strong wind from the left. And you can use this information or the natural tendency of planes to turn into the relative wind, uh, even without knowing its airspeed, to reconstruct a, a wind estimate. That's how it works, and let's see how we can actually make use of this now. <coughs> this is the architecture that we're currently uh, experimenting for airspeed fault detection and handling. As you can see already in the diagram, one thing that we can do is basically plug in multiple airspeed sensors. That alone doesn't help if you don't know which sensor is actually the faulty one. So we need kind of a way to figure out which sensor is, is giving us bad data. Are they both giving us bad data? Should we even use them? So how we do this is that we basically feed data from each airspeed sensor, and that can be any number, to a wind estimator instance. Now from the wind estimator instance, we're actually not really interested that much in its output in the wind, but we are actually more interested in the true airspeed innovations. Let me quickly explain for the few of you who maybe not, be, um, not know what that is. The airspeed innovation is basically the difference between the airspeed sample that comes from the sensor and what the estimator internally thinks the, the airspeed should be. So it's really, it gives, you, uh, it gives you an idea of how consistent the airspeed data is. Normally in a perfect world you want to see the, air, the innovations around zero with a bit of noise, then you know everything is fine, everything is consistent. So we have two of those instances running on different airspeed sensors, and then also important, we have one last instance that actually does not consume any airspeed, but that just uh, works based on the zero side slip assumption. And it's going to be clear soon why we do that. All, these, um, all this data goes into an airspeed validator and selector, which implements innovation checks. So it checks the innovation, sees if some are small, some are, are, are large, and then basically decides which one to trust more. And it also implements the previously described load factor checks as well as data consistency checks. And at the end, it spits out an, air, an airspeed validated, which can either be the airspeed data from sensor 1, from sensor 2, or it can actually be an an airspeed reconstructed from ground speed and wind estimated by the third estimator that is not dependent on any pedo. Or in the worst case, it can just tell you, I don't know, 
I, I'm not sure, my data is not consistent, don't use airspeed and it will then inform the controllers not to use airspeed and fall back to a different mode. Okay, I want to show you three uh, simulation examples, um, how this can work. So in this example, I'm going to show you what happens if you have an excessive reading on one sensor. This is how it looked like. You'd have airspeed one, airspeed two on the <laughs> right. Initially, they both show 24 meters per second. At some point, there is a step, and obviously, airspeed one is, is garbage. How would you see this reflected? You would see it directly reflected in the innovations. While there is a huge offset in the innovations of the first wind estimator, the second wind estimator is happily kind of like, you know, mean zero with a bit of noise, what you usually want to see. Then the system, what does the system do? So previously, top left, you can see that's a selected index. Zero is for airspeed one. So it didn't see any problem with that, it used the first one. But then after a couple of seconds, after the innovations grew, you see it switching to the index one, which now means that it's actually using the airspeed sensor one. You can also see it uh, reflected in the airspeed validated, uh, bottom right, which basically reveals a small time span where the airspeed is actually wrong. That's the time it needs for detecting the fault. And then soon after it jumps back to the to the previous airspeed. Um, I want to also show you partial blockage of both sensors. So, <coughs> same situation, but right now we have a too low airspeed, and even on both pitots, uh, you will see this reflected in both um, innovations. Um, the reason why you actually see it recovering is because the wind estimator does a reset, so it's not that, yeah, it's not consistent anymore after, but you've already switched by that time. So you can see that the selected index in that, in that case goes from 0 to minus 1, which is what I explained before. Um, it will use the ground speed combined with the wind estimated from the other wind estimator if its data is consistent, and then output that, and you can see that it's actually recovering to more or less the value it had before. Last example, I want to show a gradual blockage of both sensors. Um, it may not always be that obvious that the, the, the sensors are blocked, like we've seen before, but even in that case, um, it should still work, depending on how it, well you have it tuned as well. You can see that here, at some point, airspeed just gradually deteriorate, but you will s still see it reflected in the innovations, and you can take action. Yes. Um, I also want to highlight that you can definitely not rely only on these checks. Um, there, are there are definitely corner cases where this will not work, or maybe you're going to be too late in detecting uh, that the airspeed is faulty. I think eventually what will make a good airspeed fault detection is trying to use a lot of these checks, combine them with each other, and in the worst case, maybe switch earlier to not using airspeed than too late, because we know we can fly without airspeed if we, if we have to, but we should definitely not fly too long on an airspeed that might, might not be working. Okay, um, lastly I would like to say that um, we're going to test fly this probably next week on a real vehicle with two airspeed sensors. Um, I also want to mention that this can, of course, be extended to any number of airspeed sensors, and it will also work for only one airspeed sensor. You don't actually need two if you don't like. Um, I should also mention that the wind estimator is very lightweight, so there's not really a, problems, a problem in terms of resources to run a couple of these. Um, but it definitely requires some careful handling and tuning, so we will probably try to find defaults that work well, but you can get a lot of performance out of it by tuning it for your setup. Okay, I'm done. Thank you, Roman. Um, is there any questions from the audience? Awesome. Here you go. 
<laughs> Thanks, Roman. Uh, so I'm just wondering, how do you see the interaction between this new logic and EKF2? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, we first actually did some tests with using the wind estimate from EKF2 when the pedo is kind of, the innovations go high. But then also the question is, which pedo do you actually fuse into EKF2? So if you have a fault on the pedo and it's what you fuse into EKF2, you, you cannot use the wind estimate from uh, EKF2 anymore. So currently, we're going to go with the option of actually running a separate wind estimator with the side slip assumption and not using, not fusing airspeed into that and leaving the EKF2 airspeed or, or wind or innovations for now. But I think testing is going to show if we can do anything better with that. Hi, Roman. Um, if you uh, fly two airspeed sensors, do you then also have to calibrate two airspeed sensors before every flight? No, we use, we use the newer ones. They don't need to be calibrated. Right. Plus, I can add that um, you saw the wind estimator also does a scale factor estimation, which can be used if you have a non-optimal installation. Um, Uh, thank you. <clears throat> First of all, I want to say that uh, I have absolutely no experience with uh, fixed wing drones. So, yeah, just. Uh, but anyway, uh, this seems like uh, it must be a solved problem in uh, manned aviation. I mean, the airspeed sensor blockage, uh, malfunction, whatever. Are there less, some, any lessons to be learned from, from that? I mean, you don't see uh, planes falling out of the sky very often. <laughs> well, actually, I. <laughs> I was actually thinking about, on one slide, showing pictures of planes going down. Um, I, I cannot say exactly what it was, but I think it was related to airspeed and angle of attack. So I do think that it's, I mean, yeah, it's not completely a solved problem. Um, what was the question again? Are there any uh, parallels, are there any lessons to be learned from the uh, manned aviation industry? Are there any parallels with the yes, aviation industry? I, I think so. I think so. I mean, that's that's probably also one reason why we're trying to use multiple airspeed sensors. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? All right. Thank you, Roman.